In today's lesson, we will be discussing precipitation reactions. Remember the title of our chapter, Aqueous Solutions and All of the Chemistry that Occurs in Water. Well, one of our reactions is indeed the formation of a precipitate. I wouldn't mind just taking a moment and reminding us a little bit of the chemistry we learned from our first year together. One of the patterns of change we studied in chemistry was called a double replacement or a double displacement, double exchange, whatever you'd like to call it, double replacement. The general formula of compound AB reacting with compound CD, remember we have two ionic compounds, two ionic salts if you will, compound AB, CD, and we talked about outer and inners. The new products that form are compound AD and compound CB. In a double displacement, we have learned that there were three possible driving forces, three um, observations or pieces of evidence that let you know a chemical change indeed took place. One of them was making a water molecule, very specific to an acid neutralizing a base, making salt and water. When an acid neutralizes a base, water is the driving force. A second observation we studied in first year chemistry was the formation of a gas. Typically we saw that carbonates, CO3, the polyatomic ion, when they are placed into solution and start to bubble, we see evidence of change in the formation of gas. And the third driving force was the formation of a precipitate, and we used something called a solubility table. It was a chart given to us in chemistry, it hangs above my door in my classroom where we hook together the positive and negative ion and identify the insoluble product as the precipitate. When we make those solid fine particles that fall out of solution to aqueous solutions when poured together and form a solid, we call that a precipitate. So one of the driving forces of a double replacement is the formation of a precipitate. Today's lesson and the entire lesson number two in our note pack is related to the formation of precipitates. So the pattern of change is very familiar to us. Compound AB reacting with compound CD. Keep in mind that these would be aqueous, two aqueous solutions coming together. One of our two products ends up to be solid and the other remains aqueous. One of the two compounds in the solubility table allows us to determine which of the two compounds indeed is insoluble. So a little bit of background walking into our precipitation reactions lesson. When we take two aqueous solutions of ionic compounds and we pour them together in a solid forms, that solid is known as the precipitate. The solid forms when mixed solutions come together and form a precipitate. So there's just the definition, the solid chunky particle that falls out of solution is called a precipitate. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of a precipitate. The little saying that helps us remember. In solution, little adjective is aqueous. Out of solution, the solid, little s for solid. Let's take a peek at an example. Follow this demonstration, our note pack will say. Let me just put on a new slide here. Let's take aqueous solutions of sodium hydroxide, an aqueous solution of sodium hydroxide, and react that with iron 3 chloride. Iron 3 chloride. So there's the beginning. When we have an aqueous solution of, let me make that full page. We'll go there. So here we have NaOH Aq with FeCl3 Aq. Now keeping in mind, we have Na going to Cl and Fe going to OH. I always find it helpful, especially as a beginning chemistry student, to keep in mind the charges as we hook together and form new compounds. Because as we get new partners, they hook together by charges, 
do not carry the subscript with you but hook together by the new charge. So let's put our products down below since I ran out of room over here. We would form Na going to Cl and Fe going to OH. Remember that iron is a plus three charge so Fe OH taken three times. We'll need some help in balancing. We have three hydroxides, three chlorines, so we're going to end up needing some coefficients where 3, 1, 3, 1 balances our equation. I'm going to call this, uh, for the first time we're going to hear a term, this is called the molecular equation. And again, I'll be writing this multiple times, but the first exposure here, a molecular equation shows the entire reaction. Let me just clean it up and kind of write it all together. We have three units of NaOH, aqueous, reacting with one unit of iron three chloride, aqueous, forming three units of sodium chloride, aqueous, and iron three hydroxide, which is our precipitate. Now, how did I know that? Well, a couple of different ways. I recognize ordinary table salt, know that it indeed dissolves in water, just from experience. But also, I used my solubility table. And I'll show you a little trick here a little bit later on in our notes about not even needing that solubility table. I'm going to end up remembering that hydroxides are typically insoluble. So there is our driving force. It is the solid precipitate that I always abbreviated PPT. Use your solubility table and verify that for me. You hook together iron, you're going to find hydroxide when you've hooked together and find that box in your solubility table. It definitely says insoluble, therefore it is the solid precipitate, the driving force of our double displacement reaction. Now in this molecular equation, we have aqueous sodium hydroxide, aqueous iron chloride, forming aqueous sodium chloride. But what we've learned is that these strong electrolytes in which all of these are strong electrolytes, all water-soluble salts are strong electrolytes. This is a non-electrolyte because it did not break apart, it stayed together. Iron hydroxide or iron 3 hydroxide is a non-electrolyte because it does not dissociate in water. I want to turn this into something called a complete ionic equation. In this complete ionic equation, we're going to rewrite in ionic form, including all adjectives, just as I had done up above. But instead of writing NaOH put together, Na and OH, we understand that when that's actually an aqueous form, those ions are separate from one another. They have dissociated. So taking this first reactant, sodium hydroxide, and really showing what's swimming around in that water, we have three aqueous ions of sodium and three aqueous ions of hydroxide. Three aqueous ions Na+, plus, three aqueous ions OH negative. Now do you notice NaOH in a molecular equation is written in our ordinary fashion, but in ionic form we separate because it's a strong electrolyte. Let's do the same with iron 3 chloride. We recognize it's a strong electrolyte, which now we understand from lesson 1 means that it's in dissociated form. The ions are separate from one another. In solution, we'd have an aqueous ion of iron plus 3, and we'd have 3 units of chloride ion in aqueous form. Fe plus 3 aqueous and 3 units of chloride ion aqueous. We've just separated all of the ions from the reactant side. Let's do the same for the product side. FeOH3, remember, is a non-electrolyte. It will stay together, but sodium chloride is a strong electrolyte, so it indeed separates. We'd have on the product side 3 aqueous ions of sodium, We'd have three aqueous ions of chloride. Notice how I'm just distributing that coefficient, counting three sodiums and three chlorides. However, for our 
precipitate the driving force, it stays together. It is solid, a non-electrolyte. The complete ionic equation dissociates the strong and leaves together everything else. Boy, you will hear me say that a thousand times. Break apart the strong, leave together everyone else. Do you notice anything that appears the same on both sides of our equation? Let me illustrate what I mean. The same simply means, notice how on the left side I have three positive aqueous sodium ions that appear the same identical way on the product side. I also notice that I have three aqueous ions of chloride appearing the left and again on the right. The vocabulary term that expresses ions that do not chemically change through the course of our reactions as mere spectator ions. They did not undergo a chemical change. They're only in there watching the others participate. Now iron plus three, three units of hydroxide come together to form our driving force precipitate called iron three hydroxide, FeOH taken three times. The spectators are the sodium ion and the chloride ion. Do you have your charges on your ions? As I remember learning in lesson one, I get marked down if aqueous ions are not representing with their correct charge. Let's turn this into something now called a net ionic equation. In a net ionic equation, we get rid of the spectators and simply show the chemistry. I want to know just what underwent the chemical change. What's left after we eliminate the spectators? Well, the formation of our precipitate. Now friends, even though hydroxide is written first, by convention, you'll see that the positive ion is always placed in the first position. We have an aqueous ion of iron plus three, combining with three aqueous ions of hydroxide, forming the solid precipitate, our driving force of our double replacement reaction, FeOH taken three times, and our equation comes out balanced. We have moved from, and it was our first time of many practices to come, writing out what I would call our very familiar, our traditional form of equations. Molecular equations might be a brand new word, but we're used to this format from first year chemistry. We did a double displacement followed by the identity of our precipitate. Once we've identified the precipitate, in step two, we broke apart all the strong electrolytes left together the solid precipitate since it is indeed a non-electrolyte. Only the strong break apart. We identified what we called spectator ions and eliminated them to show the net ionic equation. In the formation of our precipitate, the driving force is always the insoluble product using our solubility table. Alrighty. So there's our notes trying to catch that up. In precipitation reactions, sometimes you'll hear a Greek word called metathesis. Now you really won't hear that often. I'll probably just say it once. You can put it into your note pack. At least you've heard it, but I tend to just call them precipitation or double replacements. The metathesis is simply a Greek word to represent the term transpose, which means the two positive ions exchange places. We predict the products, but however, to be certain, we really should experiment, and that just simply reminds us that even though we can go A goes to D and uh, C goes to B, outer inners, in order to really predict, you should see or, or take a good observation by experimentation. So we can predict the products by following a general pattern. However, as any chemist knows, can only be certain by experimenting. 
the anions and cations, the negative and positive, simply switch partners. You should pause the video here, pause it, and try just writing out complete molecular equations, just as we did in first year chemistry. Take the outers and inners and switch their places. And when you have your answers ready to those three you try it equations, turn the, the video back on and simply check your work. Well, let's see how you did. The first example had an aqueous solution of silver nitrate, AgNO3, is aqueous. You reacted that with an aqueous solution of potassium chloride. Not that it's necessary, but sometimes it's helpful. Ag is a plus, NO3 is a negative, potassium chloride. I don't need those parentheses, or uh, I didn't need to write those, but they're all right. We will form AgCl, positive 1, negative 1, and potassium nitrate, KNO3. Now I'm not done yet because I have to include the adjectives. What is the identity of our driving force? Checking your solubility table, did you notice AgCl is your insoluble product? It then is correctly identified as a solid, see the adjective going there, a solid precipitate, leaving in solution potassium nitrate. This equation ends up to be balanced. It did not ask us to do this, but let's add it on because we're going to be asked eventually to identify the spectator ions. Remember those spectators? They didn't do a darn thing. They're just in there observing. Who are the ions that are not part of the solid precipitate? Well, that's over here, isn't it? These ions, the potassium aqueous and the nitrate aqueous are the spectator ions. Those ions that were not involved in the formation of our solid precipitate are called spectators. Let's see what you did with equation two. Here we had zinc nitrate aqueous. Oops, I messed that up, didn't I? I'll start that over, my bad. Let me try that again. Zn, NO3 taken twice, and now my aqueous sign is being placed into an aqueous solution of barium dichromate. BaCr2O7 aqueous. Not necessary, but sometimes it's just helpful to remind ourselves charges. Zinc carries a plus two, nitrate's a minus one, barium's a plus two, and the polyatomic dichromate is also a negative two. We go back to switching partners. When zinc hooks to dichromate, Zn, Cr2O7, and so we have a plus two and a negative two, so we're good with charges. And barium will go to nitrate, so we end up with Ba, NO3, taken twice. This one will involve some coefficients. Let's see what we have. One zinc looks fine, two nitrates, two nitrates, one barium, one barium. One, oh, this comes out balanced, sorry. They're all ones. Good to check, though. How about the driving force? Is it zinc dichromate or barium nitrate? If you properly identified your driving force as the dichromate, put an adjective there of solid, and therefore we now know this has to be aqueous. Spectator ions, what are those ions that were not involved in the formation of our precipitate? Well, that would be the aqueous barium ion and the aqueous nitrate ion. Even though there's two units there, I'll just show that the spectator ions are identified as the barium ion and the nitrate ion. So our equation came out balanced with all coefficients of one. 
We identified zinc dichromate with a solid and aqueous barium nitrate is the other product. You had one more to try. Let's see how it went. You had aqueous cadmium chloride, CdCl2, is an aqueous, being placed into a solution of sodium sulfide, Na2S. Cadmium goes to sulfide. Based on charge, you get CdS. And we'll end up with two units of sodium chloride. How do we properly identify the driving force? We have two aqueous solutions. The driving force is a precipitate. Is it cadmium sulfide or sodium chloride? Well, right off the bat, you're probably familiar. Sodium chloride is table salt. We clearly know that's water soluble. So here is the solid, the driving force of our equation, cadmium sulfide. You correctly label that as your precipitate. Its adjective is a little less solid. Spectator ions, well, who is not involved in the formation of your precipitate? Spectator ions here are the aqueous sodium ion and the aqueous chloride ion. So two spectators in our double replacement patterns. I hope those went well for you. Good review in terms of remembering double displacements. Remember, precipitation reactions really only happen if I can find a product. One product has to be insoluble. So if both of my products come out to be soluble, really there is no driving force and no reaction would occur. So if all of the ions stay in solution, nothing has really happened. In the AP curriculum, you are expected to memorize the solubility rules. The solubility rules are found on page 127 of your textbook. I gave you a solubility table that's probably the most handy to, to work with. However, if you're planning on taking the AP exam for college credit or potential college credit, you're going to be expected to memorize the solubility rules. You will not be given a table. So in other words, you're going to have to just know. This is what you find on your uh, in your chemistry book talking about solubility rules. And I would like to just read through them with you. Alrighty. Rule number one, all nitrates are soluble. So put yourself a little note. If you have a polyatomic ion whose last name is nitrate, NO3 negative one, it is never the driving force. Do not pick it. It is always soluble, not the driving force. So right away, if somebody's last name is nitrate, toss it out as your choice. Rule two, all acetates are soluble. If you see someone's last name, C2H3O2 negative, it is not the precipitate. It is not the one to circle as your driving force. Nitrates, always soluble. Acetates are always soluble. Rule three, alkali metals. Now remember what alkali metals are? They're the metals found in column 1A. They're the metals that make up lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. Do you see them in that first column of group 1A? If your first name comes from a metal found in the first family, it is not the driving force. They are always soluble. The polyatomic ion ammonium is always soluble. So if the first name is a metal from column one, or if the first name is ammonium, polyatomic ion, do not pick it. They are always soluble. Toss that out as your choice. Rule four, halides are soluble except for silver, mercury, and lead. Now what are halides? Please tell yourself in a note, that's the name given to group 7A. Now the, we hear the name called halogens. 
halogens are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And if they're going to carry a negative charge, they end with IDE. So what we're talking about here is fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. Those are known as the halides. Group 7A, and a generic name for all of those negative ions, fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. So here's what Rule 4 is saying. Most of the time, fluoride, chloride, bromides, and iodides are soluble. Do not pick them. The only time they happen to fall out of solution and become your precipitate is when they're hooked to a heavy metal, silver, mercury, or lead. Silver fluoride, that's a precipitate. Silver chloride, silver bromide, silver iodide, all would be the driving force. However, if I had sodium fluoride, sodium chloride, sodium bromide, sodium iodide, they would not be my driving force as sodium ions are always soluble. So the moral of this story, rule number four, rule number four suggests fluorides, chlorides, bromides, and iodides, they're worth checking on their solubility table. Rule five talks about the polyatomic ion sulfate. Polyatomic ion sulfate, SO4, negative two. Generally, these guys are always soluble. Except, there's always exceptions, if you see the first name of lead, barium, mercury, or calcium. Lead, barium, mercury, and calcium sulfates would be insoluble. So if you see the sulfate, check it out on the solubility table. It might be your driving force. This particular slide talked about those ions that are generally soluble. Let's discuss in the second set of rules those particular ions that tend to be insoluble. Oops. Rule six, sulfides, sulfides, S negative two, are generally insoluble, except if they're hooked to a first family, because remember ammonium and alkali metals from rule number three, well, they're always soluble, aren't they? And the heavy metals of group 2A, calcium, strontium, and barium, will be soluble. Carbonates are generally insoluble, unless they're hooked to a first family metal. Phosphates, remember, let's put these here, carbonates, highly suspicious. If someone's last name is carbonate, check it out. If someone's last name is sulfide, check it out. Same is true for phosphates. Generally, that's going to be the one you select. And hydroxides. Very suspicious if the last name is hydroxide. Most likely, it's going to be your solid precipitate. Sulfides, carbonates, phosphates, and hydroxides all fall under the mostly insoluble. I have a little saying that I'd like you to write down with me. You have a little room under your rule number nine. Rule number nine, let's put this here. I'm gonna make a funny saying that has served students well through the years in helping them memorize the solubility table. The term chops, nah, lots of A's, chops, nah. As silly as it sounds, it goes a long way in helping you memorize the solubility rules. The first word, chops. These tend to be the insoluble driving force, those that stay together as non-electrolytes instead of dissociate. Chops stands for the following, write this with me. The C of the word chops are carbonates. Carbonates tend to be insoluble. H in the word chops, represents the term hydroxide. Carbonates of a C, hydroxides is the H. The term for O are oxides. Oxides is the ion that comes from the element oxygen. Most often, it's insoluble. 
P from the word chops comes from the word phosphate, the polyatomic ion that tends to be insoluble. And the S from the word chops is sulfide. Carbonates, hydroxides, oxides, phosphates, and sulfides. Put together in a word to help me remember their names, chops are insoluble, most likely to be your driving force when given a choice. How about the na? What might that stand for? This part of our little word stands for always soluble. The polyatomic ion nitrate tends to stay in solution. Nitrates, if your last name is a nitrate, you are a strong electrolyte. You will not be the driving force. The same is true for acetate. If the last name is the polyatomic ion acetate, do not pick it as your solid precipitate. Another one of our A's, alkali metals. Remember what those were? The lithium, sodium, potassium, cesium, rubidium. If your first name comes from the first column, it is not your driving force. It is a strong electrolyte and will completely dissolve. Acids dissolve in water. By the total definition of what an acid is, it must be water soluble. Remember how acids start with an H? So HA for acid. HCl, hydrochloric, H2SO4, sulfuric. We talked about those in lesson one. Acids are soluble. The ammonium is another A, isn't it? Ammonium, polyatomic ion, that could be your first name. Ammoniums are always soluble. And the last A in my chops na is always soluble. Do not pick any of these as the driving force on your product side of your double replacement. Chops na is a funny little saying, but it has really helped students memorize the solubility rules. And that's your goal, is to work towards memorizing them. You will not be provided a solubility table on your AP exam. Using these solubility tables, chops, na, we have some general, I don't remember those exceptions to the rules. You can go back and highlight these if you'd like from rules one through nine, and you're expected to memorize. What are those exceptions? We talked about the halides. Halides is group 7A. That would represent fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. Remember, these are mostly soluble unless they're hooked to silver, mercury, or lead. That's a heavy metal that pulls them out of solution and forces them to precipitate. Remember, sulfates had some general exceptions as well. Sulfates stay in solution unless the first name in front of the sulfate is either lead, barium, mercury, or calcium. They tend to fall out of solution and, and be your driving force. Those are highlighted up there in rule number four and rule number five. So repeating in a, yet a different way. I cannot stress enough how important it is to memorize the solubility rules because identifying the driving force, identifying that solid precipitate, really is key when we go to start writing our molecular and our ionic equations. When we write out molecular equations, we have to identify correctly the driving force. Now let me make this slide. I'll work it with you. I'm going to extend the page, get rid of it for a minute. We realize that there are three different categories of equations, and we've written them already. I kind of seeded this part of the lesson. The first type of equation is called a molecular equation. Very familiar from our last year when we would simply write out the whole formulas. In an example I gave you for this first molecular equation, we have a compound of aqueous potassium chromate, K2CRO4, in an aqueous form. We're going to place that into a solution of aqueous barium nitrate. 
two aqueous solutions coming together. Now in a molecular equation, we just simply write out the formulas. Potassium goes to nitrate, barium goes to chromate. Remember to consider charges. So when we hook together, we'd get two units of potassium nitrate and one unit of barium chromate. So here's our molecular equation. We need some adjectives over here. We have to properly identify the driving force. Now I remember part of our chops na. Chops talked about insoluble, na talks about the soluble. One of those solubility rules talked about alkali metals, of which potassium is an alkali metal. Do you remember that being as part of the na is always soluble? And the N in CHOPS NA stood for nitrates. Whoops, I spelled that wrong. Nitrates. So here is two components of the second category in our little funny word NA. Nitrates and alkali metals are always soluble. I now know with great certainty that that's aqueous. Barium chromate must, by elimination, be the solid. We recognize the driving force as a solid precipitate of barium chromate. And you could check your solubility table. That's fine. I'm not taking it down from on top of the doorway. Um, but work to memorize. Barium chromate is your driving force. Now consider what we called the complete ionic equation. In a complete ionic equation, we show all the strong electrolytes in the dissociated form. We break apart the strong. Remember that saying, break apart the strong. Strong electrolytes leave together everyone else. All aqueous salts are strong electrolytes. All precipitates are non-electrolytes. Leave them together. Break apart the aqueous, leave together the solid. And let's do that very thing. We have to break apart our first reactant. Out would come two aqueous ions of potassium. Please remember your charges. Two units of K plus one aqueous. We'd have a chromate ion, it carries a negative two aqueous. Barium nitrate is strong, so we dissociate it. We break it apart, separate the ions. Aqueous ion of barium. And notice how we have two nitrate aqueous ions. There is the dissociated form, the dissociated form of the reactants. Dissociate means to separate, the dissociated form. Let's do the product side. Potassium nitrate is a strong electrolyte. We break it apart, dissociate or separate into the ionic aqueous ions. We leave together the solid barium chromate. I have completely separated all aqueous salts forming their ions. I left together the barium chromate, the, uh, the non-electrolyte or the solid driving force. Now, in the net ionic equation, the third type, and really what our ultimate goal will be in writing these out, the net ionic equation eliminates the spectators and simply shows the chemistry. What is the chemical change going on in our equation? So if we just practice identifying what are those ions that remained unchanged as reactants turned to products, the potassium sure did and the nitrates did. The aqueous ions of potassium and nitrate were not part of the solid precipitate. So if we eliminate the spectators, we come up with a net ionic equation. And even though up here chromate is written first, by convention, you'll always see the positive ion written first. 
an aqueous ion of barium combines with an aqueous ion of chromate to form, let me see arrow, the solid precipitate of barium chromate. I'm going to write something. I want you to write it on your page. Ions carry charges. Because that way I'll know you heard me say a million times that without my charges on my aqueous ions, and I mean each and every time, if I don't see those charges, I have to mark it wrong. There is a big difference between an atom and an ion in their chemical and physical properties. We have to indicate that ions in an aqueous solution carry charges. You should try it. You should pause the video where it says you try it and write the three types of reactions for the for the following examples. So I'm on the bottom of page five. It's the last two examples before our lesson will be final. You have iron three sulfate and potassium sulfide, three equations. And then the final one, lead two nitrate with sulfuric acid. Write all three equations. Pause the video, work ahead, and when you're ready to check your work, turn the video back on. Let's see how you did. You've turned the video back on and now I, we're going to check those out. Iron 3 sulfate, Fe, SO4. It told me iron was a plus three, sulfate's a minus two, so we had to crisscross. Fe2, SO4 taken three times, aqueous. Reacting with potassium sulfide. Potassium with its plus one, sulfide with its minus two, so you get K2S. This should be second nature. If you're stumbling over this, that's a summer assignment. Um, just go back and study how to write out chemical formulas. It's, it needs to be just like writing the alphabet for us at this point. Iron 3 hooks to sulfide. We're going to form a product Fe2S3 and potassium goes to sulfate. We get K2SO4. Let's work to balance this equation first, then we'll identify our precipitate. Two irons balanced on both sides. We have three sulfates on the left, three on the right, two potassiums. So we're going to need a three here. One, three, one, three balances our equation. Here I notice an alkali metal, part of our Na, always, always soluble. So since the first name is potassium, it's an alkali metal. It is always aqueous. Here I have a sulfide, and I notice in the word chops, the S is sulfide. Sulfides are generally insoluble. Therefore, I know this is my solid, this is my driving force, the precipitate. We broke apart in ionic form to come up with what's called the complete ionic equation. Two units of aqueous ion iron 3 and three units of the aqueous ion of sulfate minus 2 react with 2 times 3 is 6 aqueous ions of potassium and carry that 3 through you get 3 aqueous ions of sulfide. Here's the left side of our complete ionic equation. Here's the solid. Leave it together. Fe2S3, a non-electrolyte in solid form. We only break apart the strong. Over on the other product, 3 times 2 gives me 6 aqueous ions of potassium and 3 units of aqueous sulfate, carrying a minus 2. Identify those 
Spectator ions. What remain unchanged from the left to the right? Your aqueous ions of potassium is a spectator. And the aqueous ions of sulfate are a spectator. When we eliminate the spectator, we come up with what's called the net ionic equation. What's left? We have two aqueous ions of iron 3 reacting with three aqueous ions of sulfide, carrying a negative 2 there, forming our solid precipitate Fe2S3. Here are all three equations required for the first now you try it example. We've identified the molecular, complete, and net ionic equations. Let's check that last one. We'll go a little bit quicker. You had lead 2 nitrate, Pb, NO3, taken twice. We reacted that with sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Acids are always aqueous. Pb goes to sulfate, we get PbSO4, and H goes to NO3, and we'll balance at the same time, HNO3. Well, a couple of things. I noticed lead, the heavy metal lead, when it's attached to nitrate, remember that's part of the Na of CHOPS Na, nitrates are always soluble. Also, Na. Acids, acids are always soluble. So right away, the acids that I formed here are not my precipitate. But sulfates, especially when hooked to a, a heavy metal such as lead, fall out of solution and are our solid. So the correctly identified solid precipitate is lead sulfate. Let's break them apart into a complete ionic equation. We'd have one unit of an aqueous ion of lead reacting with two aqueous ions of nitrate, dissociated form of lead 2 nitrate. Here's hydrogen sulfate or sulfuric acid. We get two ions of hydrogen, aqueous, and a sulfate ion, aqueous, forming. Keep together the solid. It's a non-electrolyte. Leave it together. Break apart only the strong. Here we'd have two hydrogen ions and the two nitrates. Break apart the strong. Leave together the precipitate. Did you correctly identify hydrogen and nitrate? Those are your spectators. They appear unchanged from left to right. So eliminate those spectators and we'll come up with our net ionic equation. We have one aqueous ion of lead, carries a plus two. One aqueous ion of sulfate, minus two, forming our solid precipitate of lead two sulfate. The net ionic equation. We have practiced, practiced so many important skills in precipitation reaction. Your end of lesson number two prepares you to do well for your assignment number two off your assignment sheet. Remember the criteria for credit? Write out the problem. and write out your complete solution under the problem, working down the page. Write the problem out first, then your answer.